So good afternoon, everyone. Good morning or good night or from wherever you are. I hope you are safe with the situation right now. I'm here to give you a small introduction to my PhD thesis, to the thesis I defended last September. So the title is The Construction of a Model for the Design of a Rotary Kiln for a Slow Paralysis of Biomass. This project was part of the Green Carbon Project that was and was developed in, at Aston University and more specifically in the Energy and Bio Bioproducts Research Institute, EBRI. Uh, it's me, Jorge Lopez Ordovas, and then I was supervised by Katie Chung and also the Professor Tony Bridgewater. So these are going to be the content we I'm going to talk about today. So I will start a bit of, of the background, the motivation of this project, why we need to where we needed to develop this project. Also, I will explain a bit about paralysis for those who are not familiar with. I will explain the rotary kiln, what it is, how it does, how it looks like. And then said I will mention the objective. What was the project about? What was this research about? What would, what, what did we do at Aston University? So then I will pass, I will follow by the explanation of the design of a rotary kiln, which combined three essential aspects the bed of solids inside the kiln, the heat transfer and the kinetics, how I integrate all together, how the user interface looks like. It's gonna be a model. So of course there are some boundary con conditions, there are some assumptions, there are some potential improvements, but they are all taken into account. And I will end up with some conclusions. So firstly, what, why do we do this project? What's the motivation for this project? Well, we know there are many problems in the world right now. We have, in terms of energy, we have the fossil fuels problems. We are running out of them. We have the climate change, which is the, the, weather, the weather is getting warmer and warmer along the time. But also, the uh, population is growing. So as the energy demand, because we need more, more energy for more people. And to produce that energy, we are producing also some waste. So what, what would be ideal? We have more people, we need more energy. Ideally, we should be able to transform the waste into energy. That could be the ideal solution to deal with these four problems at the same time, because if we use the waste as the, as the fuel, we will need to use fossil fuels. So in this project, we are following the thermochemical conversion pathway to convert the waste into fuel. So ideally, we need the energy that is renewable, which is flexible with feedstock, and, with, and that can produce fuel and energy simultaneously, if possible. So we have in combustion is a technology that is flexible with feedstock and produces fuel and energy, but it is known by emitting some greenhouse gases, so it's not that renewable. On the other side, we have the gasification, which is renewable. It produces energy, but it's not very, it's not very flexible. We know that we know that gasification is, is quite tricky to deal with the with feedstocks. Even with the same feedstock, if there are some heterogeneous in particle size. What the solution proposed here is pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is a thermochemical decomposition of the feedstock in the absence of if they are in the absence of oxygen. So we increase the temperature without any kind of oxygen. So we avoid any combustion, we avoid any flame, and it gives three products, mainly char or biochar, depending on the source you, you check. We have the condensable vapors, the pyrolysis oil, and we have the permanent gases. Also, in this project, we are more focusing on char, on the solid product. So we are using a slow pyrolysis because it produces more char than, than the fast or intermediate pyrolysis. The slow pyrolysis is known by a low heating rate, lower than 30 degrees per minute roughly, although it can vary along the, along the sources. The residence time of the vapors and the solids is longer than, the, than in the others. So we account from minutes to hours, whereas for example, in the case of fast pyrolysis, the solids, the, the vapor resistance time is lower than a second. It's really, really fast. And then the temperature that we use in the reactor for this pyrolysis, it depends on the source again, but it's around from 350 or 400 to 600, 700. In 350, 
we have the problem to be overlapping with torrefaction, which is another technology very similar, but we don't produce that much pyrolysis oil. So then this is a very good scheme of what, what's pyrolysis. So we have the initial, the initial feedstock here. We increase the temperature, we remove the oxygen, and we obtain the solid product, the char, and then the two pyrolysis vapors, which consist of pyrolysis oil or bio oil and gas. All of them with different uses, different applications. But let's focus more on the production, on the actual production rather than the properties of the, of the products, all right? Because this is the project about. So in industrial scale, we have different options for slow pyrolysis. We have many processes, we have many operational modes. We mainly uh, define the operational modes in batch processes. We, they, those, are, those are the processes where you put the biomass inside, you heat up properly all the reactor, and then you, call, then you let it cool down, and then you collect the product. We have also some, something in the middle between continuous and, and batch uh, process, which are the wagon retort, the twin report. You put a, an exact amount of biomass inside the reactor, and then you transform it into char. You, you try to collect the, va the vapors as well, and then you collect the char. So the thing is that these processes are, con are continuously operating, but it's not a constant flow of feedstock, but it's a feedstock in, form in batches. And then we have all the others, which are the continuous. So the, the continuous processes, these, have, these ones have a really continuous flow of biomass inside. It can be it can be arguable if the Lurgy Rater and Lambiot they are continuous or more semi-continuous, but I classified here uh, according to the sources I checked for the for the thesis. This normally use log, uh, lo, uh, large particle sizes, uh, trunks, uh, br br branches, whereas the others normally use uh, way smaller particles. We are talking about tips, we are talking about pellets, we are talking about residues, and mainly are the Herzog, the moving agitated bed, rotary kiln, or the Ogre reactor. Being rotary kiln and the Ogre reactor, the two most common technologies. If you want any more information, I have lots of information about the reactors. But in this study, after checking all the, well, most of the properties, most of the characteristics, we decided that the rotary king was the best option to produce char. All right. This is a rotary kiln. This is an industrial rotary kiln, actually. And what's the problem with these rotary kilns? Well, we see it's a very complex process. So remember, we cannot let oxygen get in the reactor. So we need to seal properly this rotating part. And so we have to study that the behavior, behavior of, the, of the bed of solids inside is quite accurate and it behaves accordingly to the transformation into products. The main motivation of this project is this. There is no methodology in literature for the design of a rotary kiln. There, are, there is lots of information about how to design a rotary kiln using a lot of differential equations, which are more, more than useful here, but a simple, straight, a methodology is not accomplished. This is a good scheme of a rotary kiln. So we have the entrance of the biomass here on this side, and along the reactor, it keeps transforming into char, which is more black, of course. And at the same time, it keeps releasing some pyrolysis vapors, which account for the condensable and non-condensable part. This old cylinder is rotating at the same time trying to get a proper mixture of the materials, but it's way more complex than that. So what's the, the objective of this, of this project? So the objective was to create a model that designed a rotary kiln when the inputs from the user are given. These inputs are the moisture content of the biomass, the type of biomass of the three studies in the project, and of course, the size that we wanted, the amount of biomass that we wanted to produce. At the same time, we use this, this, this design of the model to uh, create a methodology for a straight design of our, of our rotary kiln. It's not that straight, but it's way simpler than the methodology used in the, in the literature. 
it can be very useful for, for the stakeholders interested in the production of char. And of course, it's, it's very good as a first approximation. We know the size quite fast if we compare it to a, a more uh, detailed design, if we compare it to other solutions. And I talked before about the feedstocks. The feedstocks considered in this study are the ones of the Green Carbon Project and are the wheat straw, the wood chips, and the RDF. All of them are related, are considered as a waste. So we are taking feedstocks that are going to be waste from other sources. So from harvesting, we have the wheat straw. The wood chips is a normal residue in any manufacturing place using wood. And then we have the RDF as, a, as similar to a municipal solid waste, but upgraded with a higher calorific value. So let's see how we do this. This is the scheme of the project. So firstly, we start with the feedstock, we start with the capacity, the temperature or preferred product, and also we can add the moisture content here. We have the model which considers the bed of solids, the heat transfer and the kinetics, and the outputs. It's about all the sizing of the reactor, all the height of the, the, height of the bed of solids, the length, the angle it has to be inclined, the rotational speed, and also some other specification like the like the diameter of the reactor and everything. Also, we studied the product distribution and the residence time of the solids and the vapors, and we will see it now. So to start, we have the bed of solids, it's combined to the heat transfer, and it's combined with the kinetics. These three aspects have to be totally integrated into the model to ensure a good performance of it, to ensure that it works, to ensure that the transformation into the product is achieved. Let's see. So the first part is a bit of solids, as I mentioned before. So it determines the, and describes the behavior of the solids within the reactor. So we are going to give the kiln angle, the input capacity. We are going to, to tell it the feedstock. We are going to start as assuming the radius. What's the measure of the radius? And we are going to establish the initial and final filling degree, although it has been also studied, as we will see later. It's been, it's been previously as assumed to be optimized later. So we are going to get how long is the, is the length of the reactor and the, and the residence time together to the contact areas. They don't seem very important here, but in the heat transfer part, it, they are absolutely critical. So when I was researching about the bed of solids, I found about this fraud number which correlates the, the forces, uh, centrifugal, inertial, and gravitational, with the following formula. We see is the rotational speed, the radius, and the gravity taking place here. Why is it so important, this front number? Because it's used to classify different uh, motions of the bed of solids. So depending on the speed we move, the solids inside the reactor, we have different uh, so, uh, solids motion. So there is a point where it, they don't move, at all, I mean, you can rotate the reactor, but the solids keep uh, staying the, in the, at the bottom. It's similar to when we are, try, we are moving the glass of Coke or whatever drink, and we see the liquid inside doesn't move, although we are rotating the glass, so it's, it's, it's similar to that. Then we have a slumping, which is kind of moving the solids, but it's not very, it's not very steady. On the other hand, rolling, it, the solid keeps moving, so the, uh, the parts attached to the wall are moving, so it's producing a higher mixing. Then if we, are, if we increase the velocity, the speed, we have the, cas the cascading uh, motion of solids, sorry. It's a bit, it, we see this, the, the area shapes are less defined here, although higher part of the wall is covered. Then we have cataracting where some solids are already falling on the main bed which could be appropriate, but it can cause some kind of breaking of the solids and it can be a bit, it can be more tricky. And we have the centrifugal, which is the, the extreme. So every, every time we rotate something on, on the kiln, uh, the, the solids are attached to it. So as I mentioned, the fraud number is important to classify all the methods. So we see how important it is to to define properly the fraud number. And also we are using the filling degree. We are defining in this work the filling degree as the uh, percentage of the surface 
in its in its uh, surface area and its uh, section of the reactor that is covered. So it's not a volumetric, but it's a surface uh, fraction. And then this is the the coefficient related to the attachment of the solids to the wall. So it has to be lower or higher than the criti than its critical value. And yeah, we we establish the fill the filling degree. So we esta we establish the filling degree and the height of the beds of solids at the beginning and at the end. We had to assume this critical parameter to be in the right place because we couldn't study we couldn't study it in every and then we define the float number. How? With the radius established and the gravity, of course, it's it has a value. We went for the uh, rotational speed. And we, we selected the rolling motion as the <clears throat> critical value because it was the best balance. It seemed to be the best balance between the proper mixing and a good rotation and a good uh, area, a good portion of the area of the wall covered. So that was our choice. And the value was established at 210 to the power of minus three. This is a good scheme of the, of the rotary kill from the side. So we have an initial height of the bed of solids. The, we have a final height of the bed of solids. And we have here this angle. Why is this angle shown here? Because it's important for this calculation for the length of the bed of solids. This is not something that we can just assume normally because we're working with solids. It's the reactor is slightly tilted. So it's not evolving as we want. It's evolving its, on its own way. For that, we use the Siemens model. It has a problem and it assumes a constant volumetric flow of solids. It's not true, but it was the best first approximation we could obtain from it. Also a sensitivity analysis was done to estimate what was the most influential parameters on it. So this is the expression. Uh, so we est the variation of the, of the height of the bed of solids per each unit of the length is correlated with the repose angle of the solids, I will, I will go back to that later, to the rotational speed, to the volumetric flow of solids, to the radius, the height, and then again, the two, the two angles. If we, if we rearrange it, we find this integral that is very, well, very easy. It, it can be solved with some computer programming. And that's the one we use to establish the length of the, of the bed of solids to know what was the bed bit from a very big, uh, an initial filling degree to the final one. We also mentioned that there was an important part on the bed of solids model, which was the residence time of the, of the solids. So we used this expression we found in Babler paper, I think it was. And it was a good correlation. We wanted to use another expression that was not the, the typical uh, uh, volume divided by flow because we found it was, in, we, we thought it was more influenced by other parameters other than just volume and flow. It needed something, something else. So we decided to use, to use this expression found on, a, on another paper. Also, we, ha we had to, to calculate the, the contact areas of the different, of the different uh, substances inside the, inside, the bed of, inside the reactor. So we had to calculate the areas between the wall and the bed of solids, the bed of solids, and the gases inside the reactor, which include the inert gas, the pyrolysis, the pyrolysis vapors, and the permanent gases, and also those gases with the wall. Uh, we, did some, we did some research about it, and we found that the area of each of them divided by the radius and the length of the bed of solids follow this trend, depending on the, on the filling degree, once again, the filling degree of, of the cross-sectional cross sectional area, just to remember. And we found that these expressions match really well all the, all the areas. So we could, have, we, could have, we could calculate the areas with the, fi with the filling degrees easily. We could calculate the contact areas. Once given that, we are able to go to the next step. We are able to go to the heat transfer part. So what does the heat transfer part uh, need? So it needs the contact areas. It needs the thermal conductivity of the gases inside the reactor and of the material because those are the ones 
absorbing the, the energy. We need to know the target temperature because this is going to ensure that we achieve the target temperature we want for the reaction. We need the flow of combustion gases around the reactor. We are assuming there is a constant flow around the rotary kiln. And we need that temperature and we need that flow. We could use other sources. We could fire directly the rotary kiln. There are other sources to heat up the reactor. We chose this flow. And of course, we need the moisture content to operate and we need the mass flows of each of the components. How this happens, how the heat transfer happens in the reactor. So we have the three methods, conduction, convection, and radiation. I will quickly introduce them and I will explain a bit the more difficult parts. And then we have to consider the losses. And this is going to give us temperature profile, the heat transfer, and the influence. The, we can know the influence of its, of its uh, heat, uh, heat transfer method on the final result. And also we will have the flow of combustion gases. So there are three heat transfer methods, as I said, conduction with two materials at different temperature are in contact, convection, when one of those materials is moving, is in movement, or radiation when materials uh, don't need to touch, but when they are over zero Kelvin, they are irradiating uh, some energy that the other can absorb. So firstly, we start with conduction. That's the easy, that's the easy formula, but we don't have, we don't have a constant areas. We don't have, the areas keep changing with the direction of the heat flow. For example, when, when we were, talking about the, the contact areas, we saw one of them was doing a shape of a, par of a parable. So we need to take that into account. And that's why this integral is here, because it measures how the, it represents how the area varies per length of the, per length, per length. And that X is the direction of the heat flow. All right. And then we have the conductivity of the material and we have two temperatures there. Also, this parameter in the in the denominator, I forgot to say, is calculated in, in on the heat on the bed of solid submodel. We have also convection, which is quite an easy uh, expression because it's just the convective heat flow multiplied by the contact by the contact area and multiplied by the, by the temperature difference. But this convec this convective coefficient is way more difficult than it seems. It has to be calculated through the dimension as to, to the dimensionless number Nussel, and it depends on Prandtl and Reynolds number. I have more information on extra slides if you want to know more about how it was calculated. And finally, we have radiation here. It's a more complex expression as we see. So this is the this parameter is the Stefan Boltzmann uh, constant. Then the temperatures are to the power of four, which is not the power of one, which, which was before. And then we have these parameters that are the emissivities of its material, the material emitting and the material receiving that energy. Additionally, we have the view factor, which shows how the two materials interact, how, what fraction of the energy that one of the materials irradiates is absorbed by the other. It's also quite critical as we say, as we see here. So we need to consider and study it properly. I, it's only half an hour, so I cannot explain, but I'm more than happy to get into a discussion if, if you want to, to know how I calculated everything. About the kinetics, I did already one presentation in the first the Green Carbon webinar series, which can be found in this, in this hyperlink. So if you want to see, that's, that's, the way I, that's the place I don't have time here either. Sorry, guys. But I can show you the final results, which were Two steps, two reaction, two reaction steps for the for RDF, for the feedstock RDF, with different energy activation and pre-exponential factors, amber and these reaction orders. However, the wheat straw and the wood chips are calculated only with one step and this data. These reaction orders have been optimized to match as much as possible the TGA cores that we obtain from the that we that we obtain in, in that study. But still, the reactor has to tell us the product distribution. So we calculate this. We, we did some experiments, some experiments with the TGA 
and we tried to couple it with the mass spectrometry, but it was not it was not useful because we couldn't quantify. We could apply some trends, but we couldn't quantify how much gas was produced in terms of its component. So instead, I used the the results from my colleague Philippe Rego, who is also who is also working on his PhD here on with the same feedstocks, and I applied to my own to my own research. And these are the the product yields. So from the fraction of the vapors inside the reactor, these are going to be the percentages we are going to take. This is only the remaining vapor fraction. It's not that it's not the total yield, but only, only we subtracted already the char yield. So from then, we have very three three very interesting parts of the model that we need to integrate together. It was very challenging because we need to integrate the behavior of the bed of solids. We need to integrate the heat transfer and the heat flows, ensure it achieved the temperature, and ensure the, it was converted properly. So what we did was dividing the, the whole reactor into several slices, as it is said here, physically identical. This approach has been seen on other studies, and it was the, the, the idea where I where I saw it was in Center in Spain. So initially, I started with 25 steps, but I had to upgrade to 100 steps because it, it was not converging after evaporating the water. So I needed to, to adapt it a bit. And with 100 steps, in C, it seems to be working quite well. So this would be, this would be a good representation. So on each step, we have the, all the temperatures, the moisture content, the conversion of the feedstock into the product, and the gas, comp the gas composition roughly was taken from literature and my own experiments because I could qualitatively measure the, the amount. On each step, we had the radius, we, have a, we had a portion of the length of the reactor, we had some residence time, filling degrees, and the contact areas. And then in the outputs, we are given the temperatures, the moisture content, the conversion, and basically the same as the inputs to be put in, this, in, the, following, in the following step. How do we calculate each step? So in terms of the heat transfer, we start with a theoretical uh, temperature out, which is usually one degree higher than the one in. So then we calculate the average temperature on that, on that step. We calculate all the heat flows. So then we can see the heat transfer or absorb by each of the materials, and we can calculate the temperature out. Then if this temperature and this temperature match, we we end the loop one but if they don't match we have to go again here so we have the temperature out temperature in average etc 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 that's for one of the loops also we are talking about gases the conductivity changes with the temperature the what how is it called the not the density the viscosity also changes with the flow and they are important for the for the reynolds number so also, when these two temperatures are matched, we change all those properties and they come here. So we change, we recalculate again all the parameters and they have to match the temperature. So it's a bit complex process. So we have to close first this first loop and then this, this second one for each of the, for each step. And the error that we are accounting is zero. So, sorry, is one. So the differences of temperature on the three components is totally one, summing up all of them. So it's quite accurate, it has to be very accurate. But then again, we had a model, we could simulate it, we could do a lot of things already, but we needed a target to achieve because we, we could achieve many conversions, many values, and still all of them would be valid. I mean, we could achieve a conversion of 50%, 90%, 25%. How do we know if they are, if they are all right or not? So we established a, a, conversion, a conversion value of 95%. And we tried to change all the, we tried to study all the parameters that we could change on it. And we studied the rotational speed, maintaining always the, the rolling motion. So we were always also changing the radius. We changed also the kiln angle. We try to change also the initial filling degree and the radius. We see the influence of it. So we decided, I decided that from all the 
all the parameters that could be modified and changed to achieve the target temperature, the target conversion of 95%. The two most promising, the two most promising were the radius and the kiln angle. So these are the two parameters I change when I need when I need to increase or decrease the conversion. Once the hundred steps have be, have converged on the value for the temperatures, then they they achieve one conversion value. And if it's not the correct one, which has to be between 94.5% and 95.5%, it starts again. We adjust, we change in 1% the values and it starts again the calculation until it reaches. So as I mentioned on each amendment, the radius and the kiln angle are modified. And all the parameters or such as gas, uh, combustion gas flow length are recalculated and then all the steps are gone. Are, are going through, including the loops I was talking before. So the difference with the target value of the of temperature of the bed of solids at the end is five degrees only, which is a huge, it's very small difference in comparison with what we have studied before. So for example, if, if we need the conversion to increase, we have to decrease the, uh, the parameters and I used 1% values because I needed to do, to, do, to establish a, a percentage rather than an absolute value because we will see now the capacities and there are two counters as, as we will see later which indicate the consistency of the model so this is the user interface the, uh, the user interface when we open the model so we have the input capacity the feedstock we can choose the final temperature or the preferred product that we want we can use nitrogen as a carrier gas or just free free of nitrogen we can say how much how much nitrogen we want. So for example, it's pre-set up that for each uh, ton, for each ton of uh, input feedstock, there is gonna be uh, one third of the of nitrogen flow. Then we can choose between chips or pellets. We can choose the moisture content as well. And yeah, we, or we can choose the final temperature or the product if it was here. This cannot be changed because we had trouble integrating the con the Countercurrent uh, flow of gases, and then this uh, this can be also changed, and it will be um, it will have a massive effect of the model on the model. But it's up to the person. I think for us, it's established right now in thousand and hundred degrees. So the results page is like this. So we get the length, the diameter, and the kiln angle of the reactor. I established some flights, although it requires further study. We have the flow of the products, the yields, the flows, the flows are in, in wet basis, the yields are in dry basis. We have the conversion, which is between the range I set. And then here they are all the parameters. Then this is the this is a graph that shows the temperature profiles and the conversion, conversion and, and yields. So we have here the charge yield. We see it decreases because it's the multiplication of the is the multiplication of the conversion with the uh, solid flow. So in this part, it decreases. It's not only char. There is also some feedstock inside. So it cannot be. It it couldn't be uh, more accurate at the moment, but it's something to improve. And then we see here we have some iterations, some differences. So the three thousand thing is a counter that shows the income, the number of times it achieved that uh, the model did not converge on the first loop. And the 100 is the number of times it didn't converge on the second loop. We were showing in, in the, on the other slide. It's a model, it has to be, it has some boundary conditions. So it actually works quite well between 0.1 and five dry tons per hour, although it can work down to 40 kilograms per, per hour and then the target temperature has to be 400 to 700 degrees otherwise it doesn't it takes more than expected to to have an accurate result so for example the in 400 degrees we can achieve very long reactors which don't make sense at all and it still keeps running because they didn't achieve the conversion because the temperature is too low so the kinetics there are some parts i would like to improve from the project I mean, there are some parts to, to be improved in this model if someone wants to continue it. 
So the inert gas flow, I had a problem with it when it was almost fully removed. The vapors inside the reactor need further, need further uh, modeling, need further uh, more accuracy. We could have done it in some CFD modeling. We have some problems with the voidage and the behavior of the solids on the study because it's not clear on literature. The flight design was a big issue because we couldn't make it convert properly. So we had to go to an assumption that each flight uh, adds X percent of surface. Then the heat losses are calculated, but it could be it could be more accurate in terms of temperature and depending on, depending on the temperature, more or, or less heat, lose, heat loss. The product distribution do it for each of the feedstock, the properties that could be at some correlation between the temperature and the properties of the feedstock. And then there is some simulation time because sometimes it takes very many hours to, to model. And finally, we could try with the optimize, we could try to optimize the design. I'm finishing now, sorry for the time. I'm concerned about it. So, the conclusions of my research was that there is three essential aspects in the design of a paralysis reactor, which are the kinetics, the behavior of the bed of solids, and the heat transfer. We had to find a solution for each of them and integrate all of them together, which was quite challenging. And we required to use a CSTR's reactor, so the slices I was mentioning before. Of course, it's a model and we need some, some assumptions and hypotheses to, de to develop the model, which gives room for an improvement. And I know another thing to improve would be the proper validation of the model because we couldn't do it. I was about to start asking when all the situation came up, so I couldn't validate, but that's something to do. I'm quite aware of. And that's all from me, guys. I'm sorry for the time because I think I might be delayed. These are my contact details. If you want anything, if you need anything, just drop me an email or we can discuss now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge, for your presentation. Um, really interesting, although I didn't understand every problem <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so you got some questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first was from Hugh McLaughlin. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Hit path, if if the heat capacity of solids as function of the conversion. And not right now. I mean, if by heat capacity, we, we, we understand the amount of heat to increase the the temperature of the solids by one degree is not properly developed uh, or nor the conductivity that's something to be integrated more it's considered but it couldn't it couldn't be integrated it's a it's quite an easy formula i didn't i didn't integrate at the end due to time issues with my phd um and the second question was please discuss the efficiency of mixing in the bed influenced by feed success and shape is the tendency to roll Good mixing or slip, uh, poor mixing, in influenced by sphericity or sphericality. Yeah, that's that's actually something that needs further improvement. I have, I have on my model two two shapes. I have, I have the tips or I have the pellets for for which I studied the for which I studied the I studied the voidage according to the literature. So I got up numbers to the voidage agreeing with the literature that I, I had. However, unfortunately, the literature on the on the bed of solids uh, mixing and so on was quite was quite limited. I couldn't find much information. I wanted to implement it better, but I couldn't. So I couldn't I couldn't study in the lab or in the literature see anything where it was discussing properly how the shape affects the void or how the shape makes it better or worse. So in from what I know, in terms of being, for example, they mentioned here sphericity, sphericity here in the rotary kiln, that's not the best thing to do because if there, there are spheres, they are going to try to go to the end. And it may the, the, the resistance time of the solid still will be decreased. So that's not, that's not very appropriate at the moment. So I'm sorry to have a, an answer for that better. That's, that's mostly what I have. I can, we can, have a chat about that and and see what I did on the thesis. What could what could be done? Okay. Um, any more questions? Please write them now in the chat or just ask him directly. Um, otherwise, uh, can you tell me? So, is it is it use is your model uh, uh, suitable for other feedstocks too, or is it now 
mostly for wheat and uh, wood pellets. Well, it's also suitable for RDF. Yeah, RDF. The main, the main influence of the feedstocks is especially on the kinetic part, because you, we saw the we saw the table with the different uh, results of the of the kinetics. Here, the reaction order, the reaction order, and and the number of steps and everything. Also, there is a repose angle for the behavior of the bed of solids that I had to study. So I did some experiments to see how the solids behave when you put them through a through a funnel because it was the way to study the repose angle that it's is used on the residence time and on the length of the bed of solids. Okay. So that's that's the main concern about the feedstock. It it can be easily adapted to other feedstock as long as we have the feedstock, we have the parameters that we need. We can put, we can uh, add more solids to it, but at the moment is limited. I had to finish the PhD at some point and those three feedstocks were the ones selected. Okay, thank you very much, Jorge, for your presentation. Thank you, Christian, for organizing.